Times of uncertainty, uh, the church has found a way to meet and praise God for over 2,000 years. Isn't it a wonderful thing? And so this morning as we get together, we're going to gather together for worship. We're going to gather together for fellowship. We're going to gather together so that we can help one another. Uh, those of us that have full bowls can slosh off onto those who may have half-empty cups this morning. Amen. So I pray that the joy of the Lord is in your heart as we prepare for our worship. I pray that your hearts are ready and that your minds are open for the, for the word and for the singing and for even the announcements that we bring. Pay close attention because um, some of these announcements may affect you. Sister, would you come on? Good morning. If you will follow along with me in your bulletin this morning. So note the items that we're collecting for the men's shelter, and they're listed here in the bulletin, so I'm not going to go over them again. You can read. <laughs> I think so. Our Eliza Broadus offering will be concluding on Sunday, October the 31st, so if you wish to give to support our state missions, please do so by that date. And we have envelopes available on the table in the back. Our donations for Operation Bless Frankfurt are needed. Envelopes are available on the back table, and these monies will go uh, to several projects that we have under the umbrella of Operation Bless Frankfurt. And then tonight at 6 p.m., note that time, 6 p.m. Yes, 6 p.m. Yeah. Uh, please join us in welcoming Voice of Praise from the Broadway Baptist Church in Lexington for an evening of song and drama. And a love offering will be taken for this event. On Saturday, October the 23rd is our ladies' luncheon. So if you've signed up for this, you're in for a treat. No tricks. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Sunday night, October the 31st, the church will be sponsoring Drunk or Treat. In the bulletin, it says 5 to 7 p.m., but we need to change that to 6 to 8 because then we'll be compliant with the city's trick-or-treat uh, hours. And there is a box in the fellowship hall for anyone that wants to bring individually wrapped candy. Um, and we also ask that you please come in costume that night. Uh, Thursday night door hangers were distributed to the Forks Trailer Park in Ravencrest. <coughs> and I think it's like 75 plus door hangers. Out. Yeah, that was passed out. I have 80 more in the back if anybody wants to grab it to you and take it. All right. Uh, one event that didn't make the bulletin is our Wednesday night bonfire, which is on October the 27th at 6 p.m. rather than 6.30 that night. It's getting darker earlier, so we're getting started earlier. Plus, we're eating. And uh, everyone should bring their own food that night. So if you want to bring hot dogs and everything that goes with it, you may. A bonfire will be available for that. Or you can bring your own sack supper. Uh, if anyone has any of the elongated tongs or hot dog spears for cooking over an open fire, please bring those for us to use and share that night. Thank you. Good morning. I'm going to sing the verse. You have the words to the chorus and your bulletin. You jump in and join me there. With our lips, let us sing one confession. With our hearts, hold to one truth alone. For he has erased our transgressions. Claimed us and called us his own, his very own. Here we go. We're the people of God, called by his name, called from the dark and delivered from shame. One holy race, saints every of the blood of Christ, Jesus, the 
Son. Amen. Would you pray with me? Father, the blood of Christ is that that we celebrate this morning. Thank you for what that means to us and the difference it has made in our lives. Help us to come into your presence this morning with a joyful heart because of it. In Jesus' name, amen. Find a hymn, won't you? And let's turn together to hymn number 290. I'm thine, O Lord. service, Lord, by the power of grace divine. Let my soul look up with a steadfast hope, and my will be lost in thine. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to thy where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord. Sing the last verse. There are depths of love that I cannot know till I cross the narrow sea. There are heights of joy that I may not reach till I rest in My scripture today is taken from Hebrews 11.1, 1, and I'm reading from the Living Bible Translation. What is faith? It is the confident assurance that something we want is going to happen. It is the certainty that what we hope for is waiting for us, even though we cannot see it up ahead. Part of Operation Bless Frankfurt involves us adopting 12 foster children and 12 local school kids. And we buy items for the foster kids that they've requested, which can be clothing, shoes, coat, jacket, or a toy. We are only given their ages, whether it's a boy or girl, and their first name only. And the needs of our local school children or kids could be different since we've never helped them before. So we as a church are going out on faith that we can make a difference in the lives of these children by the money we collect for Operation Bless Frankfurt. If you haven't already made a contribution to it, please pray about it and consider a love offering for these most deserving ones. You can even help in purchasing their gifts. Around mid-November, we'll organize a day and we'll go shopping as a group to procure these gifts that they want. And I'll let you know in plenty of time when that date will be. Right now I'm going to read an anonymous quote because I don't know who to give the credit to, but it's always meant a lot to me. Each one of us has a unique assignment in this world given to us by a sovereign God to love and to serve those within our own sphere of influence. We've been blessed to be a blessing. We've received that we might give. So I'm asking you to walk out in faith and give so we can give these kids a Merry Christmas. These kids are hopeful that someone out there will help them 
so please give generously. These kids will always know someone cared enough to do these things for them. And we may never see the end results of them receiving their gifts, but we have our faith and hope that it will happen. So God bless our efforts in this endeavor. Just ordinary people God uses ordinary people He chooses people just like me and you Who are willing to do as He commands God uses people who will give their all small your all may seem to you because little becomes much when you place it in the master's hand just ordinary people God uses ordinary people chooses people just like me and you who are willing to do as he commands God uses people who will give him all no matter how small your all may seem to you because little becomes much when you place it in the master's hand oh just like that little lad who gave jesus all he had when the multitude was fed with some fish and loaves of bread what you have may not seem much but when you yield it to the touch of the master's loving hand then you can understand and your life will never be the same just ordinary people God uses ordinary people he chooses people just like me and you who are willing to do as he commands God uses people who will give him all no matter how small your all may seem to you because little becomes much when you place it in the master's hand oh because little becomes much when you place it in the master's hand Let's sing together again. Find the hymnal. And let's turn to 283. And can we stand together as we sing, Take My Life. And let it be consecrated. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse.
Now I want us to go back and think just the chorus again. Think very carefully on what it is you're saying, a hymn of commitment to God. Use me, just the chorus. Lord, I give my life to Thee. Lord, I give my life to Thee. Thine forevermore to be. Lord, I give my life to Thee. Thine forevermore to be. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Um, wonderful singing this morning. Amen? Amen. So, got your Bibles? Turn with me to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. Well, this morning, we're going to continue kind of looking at the Word of the Lord. Now, you may be sitting there this morning or watching and, and wonder about all those announcements. And I think it's exciting that we're putting more and more on our calendar. Amen? And that we're finding ways through this time of pandemic to keep doing what we do. We found ways to continue meeting. And one of the ways that we did that was we asked you to wear your masks. Um, and and it, I think it was a consensus almost of the church council that we thought, well, if, you're, if you come on Sunday morning when you come in wearing your mask and you go out wearing your mask while you're seated, you can take your mask off if you'd like to. So I see masks coming off already. But if you don't want to take your mask off, you still like to wear your mask, then we ask you to please continue to wear your mask. We ask you to be comfortable. Now, it's been suggested that maybe, you know, if people are uncomfortable with people around them with masks off, that maybe we could say, well, this will be a mask section and this will be a no mask section or vice versa and flip flop, flip flop over that. So, you know, we'll kind of let you figure that out for yourself. If you quit coming and quit attending because people are not wearing a mask, let me know. And, and, you know, we want people to be comfortable, amen? And we want people to feel safe. Um, but I, I believe that a vast majority of us are vaccinated from this dreaded COVID. And, and if you're not, I'm, I'm going to assume that it's your choice not to be. And, you know, if you want to go on living and living, you know, and feeling more normal, and you want to take your mask off, we're not going to have any more regulations. Once we get seated, and we're not shuffling around if you'd like to take your mask off. Because if you look around, we're fairly scattered. And we're maintaining, you know, for the most part, that six feet, except for those that we're close with and around all the time. So if you feel comfortable taking your mask off, you can go ahead and do that. And, and so that's one of our announcements along this line of just all the things that we're doing. It's, it's, it's like we're fluid. It's like, you know, everything, you know, people complain about what we don't know about COVID, but you got to realize that everybody was going through COVID at the same time, learning as we went. And so we're still learning 
And I'm praying that it's on the demise that it, that it would that it would you know become less and less and less of an issue. As I've said before, I don't think it's going to go away. I think we now have this novel coronavirus um, for a long time. I think it's going to be part of our lives as we go forward. And one of these days, you know, after we're all off the scene, they won't even be talking about uh, COVID-19 any longer. They may even wonder why if it was so bad in, co in, in 2020, why they call it COVID-19. But nonetheless, uh, so if you feel comfortable with that, we invite you to remove your mask. If you don't, you can keep those on. No judgment, judgment-free zone, amen? Um, I know that we Christians are guilty or of being accused of being extremely judgmental, but, um, and, and maybe some of us are, but this, this is a no judgment zone this morning. So if you have your Bibles and we're open to John chapter 8, one of the things we're going to look at in the Word of God and, and, and thinking about the, the things that make us do what we do. Why, why do we do what we do? Why are we planting a trunk or treat in the back of the church? And, and what do we expect to gain from that? Well, one of the things that we are working towards is building a children's ministry. And we've kind of talked about on the first Sunday evening of the month, we're going to have um, kindergarten through fifth grade. That's what we we feel capable to handle. Coming in for about an hour and a half, we're going to play games and and our thinking on that is if they're still requiring masks in school, we'll require masks for our children's ministry because we're going to be bringing in children that we don't know who they are, what their background is, things like that. So we're going to be looking at doing an hour and a half, a VBS-based thing with them. One of the main things that we're going to do is show them that the church is not a threat that this is not a judgmental zone, that this is a place that people are going to love you because of who you are, not because of where you came from or how wealthy your family is or whether you have the best clothes. None of those things. We love people because Jesus loved people. And Jesus is the one that set the child on his lap and said, you know, don't prevent these little ones from coming to me. So we want to be a church that's proactive in going out and getting those little children to bring them to the lap of Jesus. Amen to teach them about Jesus and help them enter into a transformational relationship with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. How many in here today would say amen to the fact that Jesus has made a difference in your life? Amen. amen. That sounded like a bunch of Baptists. Now, Pentecostals would have come unhinged with that, but that's okay. One step at a time, amen? Uh, we won't start off calling ourselves Baptocostal. Maybe we'll work into that. But it's one of those things that, that we, we, we want to go to the homeless shelter and we want to provide mats and we want to provide things that they need. And we want to put together things for Christmas for the children that are in need because we believe that our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, modeled that for us. And not only did he model that, but he also taught us how to be disciples. And, and so we have a passage here that's referring to uh, what it means to be a disciple and what it means to continue in the Word of God so that we can be free. That's a confusing passage to a lot of people. A lot of people argue about what's going on. So let's just take a little bit of a background look. So, so they had been coming against Jesus. And when I say that, I mean the leaders of Judaism in his day, the ones that were called the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they had kind of control of the religious order. They didn't like Jesus because Jesus came and was changing things. And they were well grounded in their religion. Have you noticed how dangerous religion can be? They were well grounded in their religion. They thought they had it figured out. They did not expect God Almighty, the Father, to flip the script. They thought they had it figured out for eternity. They were His chosen people. They were going to be in the land forever, and they were going to be God's favorite children. But we see God flipping the script on that in, in the New Testament. We see Jesus coming, and you, you, you've heard Him say in the Sermon on the Mount, You have heard it said, but I say. Well, that angered the leaders of the gatekeepers, I like to call them, of the religion of that day. And, and, and we have gatekeepers today. We have people that want to throw other people away because they said something a little differently than the way they believe it. But I don't know if you've ever read the Bible, but if you read the Bible, there's a lot of things that are hard to understand. There are a lot of things that are hard to fit together. And we have to have uh, an understanding outside of sometimes of the words that we're actually reading to know how those words were actually applied. So context is our key. So we go back and look at this passage in John chapter 8. And you'll see that prior to this, Jesus had made quite a few of them mad. And they began talking about killing him. They, they wanted to arrest him. And if you go back into chapter 7 and, and further back, you'll see that there was a feast day coming up, a feast of the Jews. It was the Feast of Tabernacles. 
that Moses had appointed to them in the law, the Old Testament, that they would gather together and they would remember the time when they were wanderers in this world. And God was their light. He was their heat. He was their source of food. He was their everything. Prior to the giving of the Ten Commandments, on, on the mount of God to Moses, this is how they, they wandered. And, and then we know they failed to go into the land when they were sent into the land. They didn't think they could do it because they appeared to themselves feeble, not only in their own eyes, but in the eyes of the giants that were in the land and the, and the people that were great at warfare. And so they were afraid and they said, Lord, we, we just don't think we can do it. And he said, fine, pack your stuff up, turn around, and let's walk in the desert for a little while. The very next morning they said, we were wrong. God said, too late. And they began to wander. For 40 years they wandered with God as their everything. With Moses as God's spokesman. And Aaron as the priest. And so they, they, gained, they, great, they gained a great understanding of what God was wanting to do with the nation of Israel. What they failed to see was what God intended to do for the entire world through the nation and tribes of Israel. Jesus being that focal point. So when Jesus shows up on the scene, he's rejected by the religious leaders of that day. I don't know why I'm doing air quotes, but nonetheless, when I do that, by the religious leaders of that day. And, and so he was teaching them things that didn't work. And, and they thought they had it all figured out. Have you ever met a, a religious person that thinks they have it all figured out? You may be sitting on the pew with somebody. They may be inhabiting the very same space you're inhabiting. Um, that you think we have it all figured out. Then every once in a while, God flips the script. Amen? He comes in and does something different than you've always done it or something that you weren't expecting. He's been doing that throughout history, flipping the script. Well, Jesus was the flipping of the massive script that God, but he was right on track with God's intention from the Garden of Eden. He was here to bring the kingdom back. He was here to establish the kingdom of God on this earth for all the children of Adam. But the people he came to, John tells us, did not receive him. He came to his own, and his own people rejected him. He came to his own creation, he being God, and his own people, the, the, the Hebrew children, rejected him as the Messiah. Now, it wasn't entirely everybody, but it was the leaders that rejected him. So they were plotting to kill Jesus. Jesus was aware of this. And so even Jesus' own brothers came to him and said, Listen, nobody does what you're doing in secret. If they want people to know who they are, they do it in public. You need to go down to the feast, knowing that the Pharisees were trying to kill him. And the council was trying to kill him. And Jesus said, It's not my hour. You all go do what you want to do. Even his own brothers said that to him. So Jesus hung back for a little bit. And when everybody was gone, under the cover of darkness, Jesus slipped into the great feast and began to teach. Now, Jesus was a teacher, preacher extraordinaire. When he spoke, people listened and they heard. And those that were willing to hear from God, those that wanted to know what was going on in God's scheme of things were pricked in their heart through the movement of the Spirit by the powerful words that Jesus spoke. And there's never been another preacher on par with Jesus Christ. Amen? But we do our best to explain who he is and what he has done. So as he's teaching, there was a group of Jews that began to believe in him. Now, this was to the consternation of the leaders and the gatekeepers. And they didn't like this at all. And so Jesus is boiling it down. He's got these new people that have been listening to him at this great feast. And he's done some things that blew their minds. He, he said, you know, if you're thirsty, come unto me and I'll give you drink and you'll never thirst again. And they're like, who do you think you are? And they asked him several times. And he did the things that the Messiah would do. But the, the gatekeepers said... There's no word that a prophet comes from Galilee. We've searched the scripture and we're not told that a prophet is going to come from Galilee. He's going to come from Bethlehem. Okay. Check that box off. But they didn't realize that. And they accused him of being illegitimate. You know, basically they picked on him and who his father was unknown to them. Because everybody knew the story of Mary. Well, Jesus talks about his father through this passage. And actually in John 8... 
One of the greatest proofs that he equates himself as God is found later on in this chapter. And I'll leave that for you to search out and to get down into. So as he's teaching, many began to believe in him. And the gatekeepers were upset about that. And they got more and more furious with him. And when we pick up the script in, in, in verse 29 of chapter 8, and, and he's speaking and he says, And he who sent me is with me. He has, left, he has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. So Jesus is in this context talking about pleasing the Father, doing what he sent him to do. And verse 30 answers the question about the power of his preaching. As he was saying these things, many believed in him. So we have a bunch of people that are believing in Christ because of what he's saying, the power of his message. And he was proclaiming that he has come as Messiah to change the world. And he's going to do something that no other person in history past or history forward can do. He was going to save not only the nation of Israel, but the entire world. Amen? Verse 31. So Jesus said to the Jews that had believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. So let's catch the audience again. So he's talking to people who are brand new believers. These are brand new believers. And what does he begin to do and immediately when it says many believed in him? He began to teach those that were listening. Now who do you think was mixed in this crowd? The gatekeepers. The people that did not want this message to get out. They never left Jesus alone. And I, I believe the same thing is true today. When we preach Jesus and we proclaim him Lord of Lords and King of Kings, I think there's always part of the enemy's crowd listening and paying attention and wanting to jump on every little thing that's said to discredit this Jesus. I mean, the world is full from the internet to books to everything else. The world is full of people trying to discredit Jesus. And they think we are fools that follow him. But we that follow him have heard the truth, realized the truth, and he has made us free, as he's going to explain right here. <clears throat> he says, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Again, remember who he's talking to? Brand new believers. He's talking to them. But in the crowd, there's a mixture of other people. And I love this. He says, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Then it says, they answered him. Now, this they right here, the antecedent to this they, I think if you go back and look at this whole passage, it says they, they, they. And when I go back, I mean, we're going back to chapter 6, and you see a they, and you see a they, and you see a they, and you see a they. These are the gatekeepers. I don't believe that the they here, I don't think the antecedent of this they is the new believers. I think it's those gatekeepers that are hanging around. Because listen to what they said. They answered him. We are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone how is it that you say you will become free? Well, the gatekeepers aren't up on their own history, are they? Have they, the Israelite nation, ever been slaves? Well, most definitely, they were slaves for 400 plus years in Egypt. They know their story, the deliverance under Moses and the walking in the wilderness and all the things I talked about earlier. That was a time when they were enslaved and, 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 they, and, they, and they also had been kicked out of the land uh, earlier on by the Assyrians and then the Babylonians and they were out for a long time until they came back and built the temple that Zerubbabel t built when the, when the, when the Greek, when the, uh, they allowed them to come back and they were allowed to start building and forming it. They had been away and been captive. So what are they talking about? We have never been slaves. They're confused on their own history, aren't they? Um, Jesus answered them. I love this. Jesus has a good answer for them. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. So Jesus is saying, you, you, you're, you're missing the fact on your own history, but let's go bigger than that. Let's go broader than that. Everybody who commits sin of any kind. Now, the Pharisees thought they were pretty good. I think that's why we call them the Pharisees. You know, they, they tithed on their income. They tithed on their vegetable garden. They tithed on their mint garden. They tithed and they tithed and they tithed. And they would fast three days a week. And they wore these long flowing robes that had these tassels on them that, that were prayer tassels covered in a prayer robe that had tassels on it with stripes on it that had definite meanings. And they would walk around, we're told, in, in the street corners and they would lift these high lofty prayers and they were 
were so pompous and so full of their self. Like I say, there's a lot of those walking around today. Um, and they thought they were better than everybody else. You remember when Jesus was looking and there was this tax collector. Now remember, tax collectors are the dogs of everybody because they were collecting taxes from Hebrew people to give to Rome, the people that occupied their own lands. They didn't like Rome. They fought against Rome. And so one time Jesus was speaking and, and he said that there was a guy who went to pray and, and one of the tax collector to beat his chest and bowed his head and said, God have mercy on me, a sinner. But then a Pharisee came up and he began to pray and he had this high exalting prayer and he said, I thank you, Lord, that I'm not like this tax collector over here. I'm a better person. And Jesus asked the question, so who went away justified? The one who thought he was better than his neighbor or the one realizing that he was a debtor in sin asked for forgiveness? Who went away justified? The one who owned his sin and his failure. So, so Jesus says, if you're a sinner. Now, when, when we talk about being a sinner, the Bible tells us in, in Romans that it hits every one of us square in the eye. One of the problems we have today is that people don't want to confess that they are, in fact, a sinner. They're okay in everything that they do because, well, God made them that way. Or, you know, I have an anger problem or I have this problem or that problem. I had a guy tell me one time that, that he harbored more lust in his heart. It was just his genetic makeup. He was just born that way and, and, and there was nothing he could do about it. So he was overlooked by God because he was emblazoned with this lust and God must understand when the Bible says, no, repent and turn from your sins. Amen? Repent and turn away from that. And so these people came to Jesus, the gatekeepers, and said, we're not sinners. We're, we're, we've never been in any kind of bondage whatsoever. How is it that you can say that we will be made free? We've never been captive. And Jesus says, you're so blind you can't even see that you are captive to sin. You're trying to cry out how righteous you are to me and how good you are to me. And even in your crying out and your boasting, you are sinning even more. And they couldn't see it. They were lost to the fact. And Jesus says, everyone that practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. Now this was a a society that had indentured servanthood, different than what we had earlier in America, but, but they had people that worked. And when you're working for somebody because you're in debt and you've got to work for them, and you're working in the house, and you're one of the servants that takes care of things in the house, no matter how much they praise you, no matter how much they think of you, no matter how, how well you do your job, you're still not in the family, amen? You're not heir to anything the master has. You're still outside the family. So Jesus is trying to teach them, these people that claim to be children of Abraham, that no matter how good you think you are, you're nothing like Abraham. And he goes on later, and we won't delve into that. He, he lets them know, you don't do the things that Abraham did. You, you don't practice, you say you're children of Abraham, but you don't do as Abraham did. You're trying to kill me. And they said, nobody's trying to kill you. Yet they were. They were plotting against him. So you had that double speak. And two, it's about like American politics. Amen? Say one thing and do another. Even though you're caught, deny, 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 right? That was being practiced by humans then as it's being practiced by humans today. And so he says, so the sun remains forever. So if the sun sets you free, you will be free indeed. Amen? So let's go back and see what he's saying here. So, so he's speaking to the they that are the gatekeepers. He's also speaking to the they that are the new believers. And the, what I want to focus on today is that smaller they of new believers. The they that was in there that heard his speaking and it pounded into their heart. And they said, this is truth. And they were excited and they began to believe in him. And believing in Jesus, as we teach in Baptist churches all over the world, that it's about faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. It's not about any works that you can do, but believing He is who He says He is, and that He will do what He says He will do. Faith in Him equates imputed righteousness from Christ. Amen. We believe and trust in Him. So He's telling them, uh, after, they, after He sees this group, He says, If you abide in My Word, you are truly My disciples. Now, again, as I have mentioned before, they didn't have this. The part of this that they had 
would have been what we call the Old Testament, which is this much in my Bible. Well, that's pretty good writing right there. That's, pretty, that's a pretty good amount of writing. They had that. But they didn't carry it with them. Nobody carried the scroll with them. The scroll was well guarded and well protected because it took a long time to write that much. And so a lot of places didn't even have it all. They just had parts of it. And a lot of them didn't even believe all of it. They just believed parts of it, like the first five books of what we call the Old Testament. So they didn't have God's Word in this form. They had synagogues that they could go to, and they had priests, and they had teachers that could explain to them what this says and means. So what is Jesus saying when he says, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples? See, they had been following him and heard his teachings. And you know what those people that heard his teachings did? They repeated his teachings. And it had the power and the authority in that day that we attribute to this in this day. And so Jesus is drawing a distinction between a believer and a disciple. He says, you're here because you believe in me. It says that many of them believed in him that day. And he says, okay, you believe in me, abide in my word. Now that word abide means to continue, to dwell, to, uh, to abide, to hide, to be covered with. So that word abide in my word. If you abide in my... You know what that means? To continue in the teaching. Now, I have a word um, today that is a, a word of praise for me that I believe that this right here is his word recorded. Amen. They passed it on orally. They began to write it down. And by the 30s, 40s, or 50s of the New Testament era, they began to have documents that we call the New Testament. And they began to pass them around. The last one of these that we hold as Scripture... Was, was Revelation. It was written by John later on in his life. So it's one of the last books to be added to the New Testament. James being one of the first ones and Galatians being one of the first ones. And then we have the Gospels that are being written and passed around. And they were the, they were the true testimony of what Christ said. So today we're not like those early believers in the crowd that didn't have a written document. We have a written document. Therefore, I think we may stand a little bit more of an expectation. Amen. But these people were expected to practice. So Jesus says, you believe in me? How about being a disciple? And, and I've, I've always been one that draws a distinction between a believer and a disciple. Because there's a whole lot of people that trusted Christ as their Savior when they were in VBS one day when they were nine. And they still mean that and they still believe that and they believe they sa they're saved. But they've never invested their life into finding out who their Messiah is. What his teachings are and those kind of things. So when we talk about a disciple, by the way, of being a believer versus a disciple, is not a choice the Bible gets you. But it is something that we see, a believer versus a disciple. A disciple is one who says, I want to practice the teachings of Christ. I want to see how he operated. He's my master and therefore I'll, I'll, I'll operate as he operates. And then Jesus goes on and says, if this is the case, if you're a disciple, if you're in his word, continuing in his word, you will be set free. Set free. From what? Well, he goes on and explains it later on that if you're a sinner, you're a slave to sin. But if you've come to know Christ as your Savior, you have been freed from your sin debt. You no longer have to answer for the sins in your life. Do you still commit sins? Yeah. Yeah, you still commit sins. If you know anything about the Word of God and the teaching of Christ, yes, we still commit sin. We're no longer slaves to sin, though. We don't have to. We usually fall off of our study and our intention and we get bothered by the things of this world, making it, being successful in this world, getting the things that we think we need to have, to, to have true happiness or fulfillment. And then if you talk to anybody who has achieved that, they'll let you know that money won't bring you happiness. And I don't know many people who can actually say money won't bring you happiness because I've never had enough money to say, hey, that's true. It never brought me happiness. I, I've thought for a lot of my life that, you know, if I had a little bit more money or if I had a few more things or the latest this or that gizmo, it would bring me happiness. And it does bring a momentary pause in the utter uselessness of life in this world for stuff because you got something you didn't have a minute ago but it soon passes how many times have you bought a phone or a car to go home and sit down turn on the tv and see a commercial for the next model 
in stores today. You think, why didn't they tell me when I was there buying this phone that tomorrow the new phone's going to be out? And then when you go back, they don't want to take it back. They want you to buy the new one. So it's this, this world of constantly seeking after. And the disciple of Christ is free from that. We're free from the burden of our sin. We're free from the future that we don't know who holds or how it's going to be. We have been set free from that. We are now gathered as a, as a hen gathers her chicks. We're gathered by Christ and we're brought into Him. And one of the greatest things that we could do is spend time in His Word. And thank God we're blessed with, I believe, to be the totality of His revelation that we need is right here. And everything that Christ did or said is not recorded here, but all you need to know is. And if we would continue dwell in His Word. Well, what is dwelling? What does it mean to dwell in His Word? Well, a few things that pop up just kind of in line is, first of all, read it. You say, well, I get that. Do we? Do we get reading God's Word? I mean, we read a lot of things and we keep up with lots of stats, but do we read in God's Word? And I've had people through the years tell me, Rusty, you get it differently than I get it. And so I'm just not even going to try. Now, they didn't say I'm not even going to try, but that's the way the conversation went. I'm like, you know what? I started one day, and I couldn't understand what I read. I couldn't make sense of what I read. I would read a little bit back here, and I would read a little bit over here, and I'd read a little bit over here, and it didn't seem to go together, and I just don't understand why everybody kept talking about how wonderful the Word of God was. And then I read in Psalm 119, and David said, How glorious are your teachings. How, how wonderful are your commandments. How, how great are your decisions. I'm like, I'm not feeling that because all I hear is don't do this, don't do that, don't do the other thing. And I just couldn't see how glorious that was until I was released from that. When I was set free from my own mind's limitation for what God had for me in His words. I think the first thing about dwelling is to read it. Now, the, the word that comes to mind when I think about reading is habitual. We should be habitual readers of God's Word. It should be a habit in our life that we spend time in God's Word. Now, I'm all for a morning devotion. I just don't usually pull that off. But my morning may begin at 7, and I'm not reading and studying until what I actually call the real morning about 10 o'clock. I've had enough coffee. I've wiped the sleep out of my eyes. My joints have quit hurting a little bit. I'm able to move around. And then I'm able to sit down and just open His Word. Not everybody has that capability that they can get up at 7 and not get started in their day till 10 o'clock in the morning. That was a joke at my previous pastorate. They would always say, when would you like to get together? And I would always say, 10. And these guys that were older than me at the time, they wanted to get together at 5. Because they had been up for two hours because their body would no longer let them sleep. And so at 5 o'clock, they were up and at them. And by 7, they were ready to do something. I'm like, 7? I'm just now thinking about waking up, much less getting out of bed. 10 o'clock is when I start functioning well. And it's just a product of my body. My mom had always told me growing up that if I ever fell into a coma, I was never going to wake up because I enjoyed that state. We, one, one night in the middle of the night, the shelf in our room, in my closet, and we had a closet that was, it was probably five feet wide. That's a typical closet width. It was five feet high with a wooden shelf up. I don't know. It's probably here now, but when I was little, it seemed way up there. And it was full of games, and it was full of things that made lots of noise when that shelf collapsed. Two o'clock in the morning. When they informed me the next morning around eight or so o'clock, that my shelf, because I got up and I'm like, what's all this in the floor? Well, mom and dad had got in there in the middle of the night because they heard this huge crash, and I'm sure they assumed that their eight or nine or ten year old boy was climbing on something and it crashed, and then I was in the bed and I was asleep, and I had no idea that I sleep through. I tell people all the time I could sleep on the hood of a moving car. Now, that's no longer true. My shoulders and hips will not let me sleep very long on one side. I mean, anybody else identify with that? But, but it's interesting how the reading of God's Word has to be habitual whenever you place that in your life. The Bible doesn't say read your Bible in the morning, read your Bible in the night. It says to always dwell, meditate on the Word of God. We're told in Joshua 1.8, let this book of the law 
dwell and meditate on this book of the law. Then will you make your way prosperous, and then you will have great success. And that's in Joshua chapter 1. So it's the meditating and the dwelling. That's not an Eastern form of meditation. Sitting in some sort of lotus position with your fingers touching. Um, you're familiar with that. You see it all the time. Meditation on the Word of God is not empty your mind and waits up for something to, f to fill it. But as you read the Bible, you fill your mind and then allow yourself to... And the word for meditate in the Old Testament is like mumbling. It's like a cow chewing its cud. Just chewing, chewing, chewing. Puts it in one stomach, brings it back up again, chews it, chews it, chews it. Puts it back down in that stomach, brings it back up again. Nasty, right? But that's a beautiful picture of what it means to meditate on the Word of God as you're reading and you're dwelling in the Word of God and, and you're reading it intentionally and something jumps out that you just didn't know was there or, or maybe I don't quite understand that yet and you begin to hang it on the back of your mind, hang it on that little nail back there as one teacher told me. And she said, revisit it often. Go back and think about that what you don't understand and allow God in His process of illumination to reveal to you what he means by that. That's, that's habitual reading on it and then studying it. So we're reading it, but then sometimes we need to study it. Now, I've not met many people in my life that studies like my father-in-law studies. He'll sit down at his computer at 5 o'clock in the morning because he's one of those, and he begins to read, and he begins to study, but then he pulls up the the Greek of that passage. He's, he's passionate about the Greek and he reads in there and he studies on it. Then he'll go grab what, is this, what does this dictionary say about that word and what, what's an understanding and he just, he just walk and he's like that, that cow in her cud, amen? He, he gets that up and he dwells on it and then every once in a while he'll come up with a few printed pages for me. He'll say, hey, I was reading and I've come across this and sometimes he'll say, how do you think this works out? And that always makes me nervous because I know he's well studied before, studied before he ever asked for me anything. But a lot of times he'll say, listen, when I heard somebody say and what somebody else said and what this word actually means and what it means in its tense here. And, and he just wants to reveal because he studies the word of God. And, and, and Jesus said, if you want to be my disciple, dwell in my word, which means to read it and have it part of your life, go over what you've understood, but then to study it intentionally, to, to get down to the nuts and the bolts of what's in here. What does it actually say and what does it actually mean? And what did it mean to those people? You want to get confused? Look at the beginning of what Jesus said. He says, so Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, if you'll abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, right? And the truth will set you free. And it says, and they answered him. Well, a lot of people say, well, those same people who just became believers of Jesus rejected him in the very next verse. Now, my theology doesn't allow for those to receive him to then reject him, to receive him in belief and then throw him away. So you look at that and you say, well, why would they do that? And, and it confuses people. But then if you study and go back a couple of chapters, you'll see there's a multitude there and there are multiple different they's. And so you study on this and you get intent on it. You're like, ah, oh, he's talking to his believers, but there's a crowd of unbelievers interspersed among them who are trying to shoot down everything he said. Dwell in the Word. Read it. Study it with intention. So we need to be habitual and intentional. And the last one I'll bring out this morning is we need to apply it. We need to apply the Word of God that we've learned, that we've studied to our life. There, I, I heard a, a, a teacher teach one time that there should, when we read the Scripture, there are questions that we can ask. Is there a sin I need to forsake? Is there a habit I need to uptake? And he goes on and on and on. As we read, we should ask these questions. Is there something I need to start doing? Something I need to quit doing? Something I need to start practicing? Something I need to include? Is there a new way for me to think about this or about that? And, and as we go through these things, and so the last one I want to say is we need to apply, um, which is the practical. We need to be habitual, intentional, and then practical about the Word of God. This is an ancient document, but it's relevant today. Amen? Is this relevant today? Have people changed? 
No, we can look around and find the very same crowd Jesus was talking to. Sometimes in our very churches that we come together to worship in, we can find naysayers and we can find doubters and we can find correctors. Anytime you want to try to do something new, they'll say we've never done it that way. Or we tried it once and it failed, right? We get those kind of things. Then you got people that are like, here's what we need to do. I know how we can grow our crowds. And I've had people come to me and say, we need to grow our church. And I say, well, how do you want to do it? And well, we could have a bingo night. Night, or we could have a lottery night. And I'm like, well, why don't we have beer and pretzels? That'll pack them in. <laughs> amen. I'll be there. I got an amen right there. But I mean, you know, if, if we're not, if we're going to stoop to the world's tactics, we're going to get the world's people. Amen. And, and they're not going to be hearing what the, could you imagine taking a bar room full of people that have been drinking for way too long and try to tell them about what the Bible has to say? They couldn't be any more interested in that than anything else in the world. So, so if we're going to be habitual and intentional, we need to be practical. Now, as I think about practicality, I was reading a recipe this week. You all read recipes? I love recipes. I found a way to make minestrone soup last week that just is absolutely delicious. Loved it. I was like, oh, this is good stuff. So what I do? I clipped that email. I emailed it to myself, that recipe. But as I was reading different recipes this week, I was watching one lady who was teaching you how to make these delicious apple things. Now, I don't know exactly what they were, but they were bread, they had some egg in them, and they had little bits of apple in them. And I thought it was interesting, her description, because she talked about whisking together the, 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 wet, the dry, and then, and then whisking together the wet, and then she blended the wet, and she blended the dry by whisking it, and then she said, fold in the apples fold in the apple. And she said, I would love to tell you what it means to fold in, but I don't have words for that. You either understand fold in or you don't. People don't understand. And so folding in is something you need to be trained in. When you're folding your dough and you're folding things into it, it's not like putting it in the electric mixer, is it? Folding in. So she said, fold in your apples. And I immediately, being the preacher I am, said, ooh, yeah. Anybody you talk to who has cooked very much at all, they understand folding in. I talked to a guy one time and, and we were talking about something and I said, well, I find that when I'm making this, because I get around guys that cook sometimes, and I said, you know, you, you have to emulsify like your vinegar and your oil. And he said, emulsify. He said, you must cook because nobody uses that word except for cooks. Emulsify. And that's where you can't tell the difference between the oil and the water. Amen. It don't last long, but it will for a little while. And, and we have that terminology that we use that you have to be a product and in possession of the tools and understanding. It's kind of hands-on. Anybody understand hands-on? If you've ever removed a bolt from the bottom of an oil pan without being able to see it, you understand what it means to be hands-on. And you say, okay, now feel for this. And if you don't know what that feels like, you, you'll never find it. But, but, you know, describe feeling for the, the head of a, of a hex bolt. And, and how do you describe that? Well, it's got a lot of points. Well, what doesn't have a lot of points under the hood of a car? But if you've ever grabbed the, hex, the head of a hex bolt, you know what that feels like. And you can just about gauge the size of that bolt by feel alone. And, and I think that's what Jesus is getting to when he says that you need to dwell in my word. It's not a passing glance. It's, it's not a two-minute devotional. I'm all for those. But add something to those of substance and dwell. I've been studying in Haggai for the last little bit. I'm just loving it. i got to go back and read and reread it. And I'm, in the book of Haggai and, and Hosea as well, you're like, why? There's just something in there, but I can't quite grasp it. I don't get what the Spirit's teaching me yet in Hosea and Haggai. So you know what I do? I chew it around for a little while. Then I swallow it again and go on about my life and then come back and regurge it, get back into it again and chew around on those verses that, that, that are a little bit hard for me to understand because I want to gain what Christ has to offer me. And he says, if you're my disciple, you will continue in the Word, and the Word will make you free because you begin to lose the shackles and the bondage of not only sin, but the hook that this world has that it wants to bury deep into you. You can walk aloof and apart from the cares and concerns of this world. You can, you can hear what's crashing and falling apart, and it's more of an oh me, or, and it's, it's less of an oh me than it is huh. Isn't that interesting? 
Well, the Bible says in the latter days, amen, you have a grasp on the Word of God and you're free from the worry, you're free from the concern, you're free from the dread, you're free from the doubt, you're free from the confusion that this world walks in. And we find that by dwelling in the Word, which Jesus equates to being a disciple. To being that person that says, I want to be covered in the dust of my master. I want to walk so close behind Jesus that the dust his sandals kick up lands on me. I want to be so close to Christ that when he stops, I bump him. Amen. And he says that's achieved by dwelling in his word. Continuing in his word. That has made the biggest difference in my life. Is the constant pursuit of what does that mean. So that I then can fold that into my life. And to where it's so much a part of my life that you can't see rusty anymore at all. What you see when you see me is Jesus. I am not there. That is my goal. To be that disciple. I'm looking forward to the day when Jesus says, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Aren't you? Won't that be a glorious day when we're all gathered together and all the cares and all the worry and all the pain, all the distress of this world is gone and gone forever and we have eternity in the presence of of the living God because of the sacrifice Christ made for us. Amen? Let's have a word of prayer and then this morning I'd like to have a time of invitation. I'd like to invite you if the Lord's been speaking to you. Maybe not this message. Maybe not something I said this morning. But maybe there's something that as the, as the cow and her cud that, that, that God keeps bringing up and you keep thinking on it. And maybe is there something that you need to release out of your life. Maybe, and maybe just kind of walking down an aisle, taking a spot here, what we call the altar, these steps. Just take a spot and, and pray. Uh, maybe you need to come down the aisle and talk to me and say, you know, I'm struggling with this. Or I want to thank you for this. Or I want to praise God. He's done this in my life. And I want to testify to the goodness of God this morning in Jesus' name. So we're going to sing a few verses of an invitational hymn this morning. And then we'll have our time of being in one another's presence in the afterglow. Let's pray. Father God, today, thank you for the word. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the teaching. Thank you for the they in the crowd that heard what he said and believed. Just as one day we were those in the crowd and we heard what the Spirit said. We thank you for salvation. We thank you for making us your children. Now, Father, en engage us and help us and lead us as we walk along the path of discipleship. May your word grow deep roots in our life, and may it bring forth much fruit as we give you all the glory for everything. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.